We're going to talk about energy abundance now with Dan Walter from Ember Energy. And this is really interesting because we have some folks in the energy media community who live in communities that are right next to uh, wind turbines. And there's so much cheap energy uh, available to them. And they've been asking themselves the question, why can't we use this as an economic development tool? For example, uh, they could uh, site uh, data centers right next to these wind turbines. The data centers would love it. They have a, a that's when <clears throat> you have a, abundant energy that's low cost and reliable, it allows you to think outside the box to do things you couldn't do before. And so I'm going to talk to Dan about that. Dan, um, what's your take on, maybe describe to us what your report means by abundant energy. So the switch that we're seeing, the transition that we're seeing in the energy sector happening from fossil technology into electrotech is really, I mean, it's three main shifts, I would say, at sort of uh, if, we, if we zoom out. It makes energy much more immediate, local, and abundant. What do we mean by immediate? Well, it's actually just fossil fuels is just old sunlight, right? This is sunlight that fell on Earth millions of years ago, got caught in plants, compressed for millions of years, and we now pump it out. So it's just basically using old sunlight versus the new system, which is using it real time. The sun falls down and we immediately use it. That can be done locally anywhere on Earth. It's not dependent on where exactly what type of plants were compressed 350 million years ago. Everywhere on Earth, the sun shines and the wind blows all over the world. And so that means that it also becomes more local. So we have this much more immediate and local energy source. And then it's also much more abundant because if we look at just, just to, for context, every five days, the sun sends us about 50,000 exajoules of energy. 50,000 exajoules of energy is as much as all fossil reserves that we have on Earth. So every five days, the sun sends us for free sunlight that the only thing we have to do is put a panel up and uh, convert it into useful energy. And so this is the tremendous sort of shift that we're seeing is there's this energy abundance that we can achieve all over the world. So this immediate and local energy is also about a hundred, if not a thousand times bigger than the fossil reserves that we have on earth. And so that is what we mean by a great boom of energy abundance is that We've, went, we've been on this long ride of society where we, we strive to have more and more direct impact on our surroundings. And that started, of course, with uh, the foragers uh, building small settlements once we became farmers. Then around 250 years ago, the start of the Industrial Revolutions and fossil fuels. And we're arguing we're now taking another leap in this, another main leap in, in energy availability uh, fossil voltaics, uh, photovoltaics, as we call it. So we get sort of this this next uh, transition in these major human transitions from foragers to farmers to fossil fuels to photovoltaics. And that's the excitement and the energy abundance story of Electrotech. Um, one of, this also raises the issue, particularly around solar, not so much for, for wind, but for solar. And that is distributed energy resources. Because I remember two, three years ago reading reports and saying, oh my gosh, there's so much uh, opportunity to generate electricity locally, store it locally, and then distribute it locally in microgrids or into directly into buildings or what, whatever it might be. And then and the, and the, the message always was, how do we unlock this? How do we make this work? We, do, we can't figure it out. But I think the costs have come down and the other enabling technologies like AI and software and, and so on, you've mentioned some of them in previous interviews, has become so much better and cheaper now that we're, we're suddenly discovering that Pakistan can import you know, billions of dollars worth of Chinese solar panels and suddenly you've got them everywhere. Or Germany can hang uh, solar panels off balconies and plug them directly into their wall sockets and make them work. So we're beginning to innovate around these basic technologies so that they are local and they do serve a purpose and they do it economically. And now people are saying, hey, how, how can I turn that into a business opportunity? And that's a big, uh, that's part of the revolution that I don't think still even gets enough attention. Yes, exactly. It's one of, the, one of our big three drivers that we see of change, of electrotech. It is 
physics and economics are in favor of Electrek, but geopolitics are, of course, hugely in favor of building out Electrotech. There, 75% of the world is an import of fossil fuels. Half of the world uh, imports fossil, or sorry, 25% of the world imports more than 5% of their GDP worths of fossil fuels. This is an incredible exposure. The wind and solar are available across the world. And with electrification, you can use all that energy to power your entire economy entirely independently. And so really, we, we get to this uh, realization that, um, you know, there's always like this sort of joke of like, oh, how lucky it is to be Texas or how lucky it is to be in a, a Saudi oil shike where you can just find oil in your backyard. With solar panels, we're all Saudis now, right? We're all Saudi oil princes right now because the oil falls from the sky, it doesn't come from the ground. Um, and that has, of course, good and bad uh, conclusions, or the, the mainly good conclusions for most people on Earth. For those 75% of importers, this is great news because you can become independent. But it, of course, also means that for those economies that are heavily indexed on fossil fuels, this will not be a great time for them because their unique selling point, their monopoly on having access to energy, to those old sort of dinosaur time leaves that fell and were compressed for millions of years, that unique, those unique uh, the positions that they have no longer are so unique. And so these economies need to rapidly reshape themselves. And thinking here, of course, of the Middle East and thinking of Australia, but of course, also Canada. It is a rapid rethinking of one of your unique selling points is no longer a unique selling point because the sun shines as much energy on your neighbors as it does, as, as what sits in your ground, probably an order of magnitude or two more even. And so it, it's a great rethinking that we need to do in these economies on how to redefine our unique selling point. Speaking of rethinking, there's a rethinking going on globally about what energy security means. Now, we hear this in Canada all the time, and we hear it in the United States because of Donald Trump's energy dominance doctrine. But the old way of thinking about energy security is having enough fossil fuels, uh, enough su uh, a supply, so that you always have what you need at a reasonable price. And so to make an economic. In the new way of thinking about energy security, it's how can you generate electricity at home on the supply side and then adopt these other, you know, the, the demand side technologies like EVs and heat pumps and use the connecting technologies to make all of that work together in a system so that you can stop importing oil and gas and, and oil and gas for sure. And I'll give you an example. China last year imported $325 billion US of oil and $40 billion worth of gas. That's a powerful, powerful incentive for them to electrify their economy. And now what we're seeing in Asia, which is where all the energy demand is supposed to go you know, between now and 2050, is countries like Malaysia have specific policies, import substitution policies. They want to electrify to stop sending those foreign currencies, their reserves, out to pay for oil and gas imports. And I don't think we, we in the West have not cottoned on to the way the global South is redefining energy security. Yes, and it's security, but also economics, of course, uh, the economics that speak in its favor. So it's also just about getting cheaper energy um, and it's security also on a, on a much deeper level because, um, Yes, you still need to import technologies then from China, like solar panels and batteries. But once you have them deployed, you are fully independent for many, many years. And if you on top of a import industry for the next decade of electrotech, you, if on top of that, you set up a recycling industry to reuse solar panels and remanufacture the batteries that are at their end of life, you can actually talk about, you know, 50, 60 years where you keep recycling the technology that you get in. So there is a, this is energy independence on a whole different level. And I think that's just incredibly exciting for many countries in the world that have just gone absolutely, like whose economies have just really suffered under, under being fossil import, uh, importers. Think for instance about the war in Ukraine, which was of course a disaster for Europe and gas prices shot up, uh, bills became too expensive to pay in many countries, governments had to step in. This is the Western streetlight through which we look at this. But, but think about this. Why did prices get so high in Europe? It's because the whole world started redirecting natural gas, liquid natural gas and coal and other stuff to Europe. That meant that other people that had ordered these things did not get it. And their prices also went up. 
a lot of countries in Asia and in general in the global south also felt this shock. And that is, of course, a, a, a great a realization of how vulnerable you are if you're competing against the West that has an insane willingness to pay to keep the lights on to the extent where we want uptimes of 99.99999% of the time in the West. And we'll be we'll able to pay three, four hundred, five hundred dollars per megawatt hour for it. The moment anything goes wrong in the supply chain, Europe will be fine. Well, fine. They'll pay a lot. But you, if you sit in a country in the global south, if I'm Thailand or if I am uh, Nigeria, I'll just be priced out of the market and my lights will actually go off. And this is the scary risk of the fossil unwinding uh, uh, that we're currently seeing is if fossil fuels unwind and if geopolitical tensions make these price swings even more violent, how exposed can you be? It's not even want to be. How exposed can you be as an economy before your economy just comes to a standstill? And this is the promise that, of course, Electrotech has for these countries, is that you can just de-risk against probably the worst thing that can happen to your society, which is being cut off from its primary energy supply. Ben, another fascinating conversation. Thank you very much for this. Thank you, Marco.